Uh, we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about this trending topic. Before I introduce the panelists, if I could just um, address a logistical point, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the panel. Um, so if you do have a question, if you could leave it to the end and then come up in the aisles to the microphone and put your question to the panelists. Uh, so I'd like to quickly introduce our wonderful panelists. Uh, we have Marcus Clavin and Debbie Whitehead from Serco and Holly Middlemas from ASOS. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, their roles, and their organizations. Um, and Marcus, if we could please start with you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, as uh, Lauren said, I'm from Serco, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you in the room have never heard of us. In fact, we are a pretty extraordinary company. Uh, we're a team of around 120,000 people, and fundamentally what we do is we help companies and governments across the world transform their service delivery. So we run everything from uh, providing swift and safe travel through to protecting borders, uh, just as immigration, and also helping brands such as EasyJet, Google, and Barclays provide excellent first-class customer service. Um, so whilst you might not have heard of us, you certainly probably have used and been involved and engaged with some Serco people. And my role in the organization is, is twofold. I, I'm, I joined Serco just over two years ago, and Serco started very much as a business that grew very quickly organically and without really a focus on brand or marketing. So I've been involved in defining what the brand strategy is with the business strategy going forward, and with that, uh, what it is that we needed to become in terms of our people and how we need to support that in respect of recruitment. And we've made some significant progress on that front, which we we're hoping to share today. Um, but the fundamental piece is really around our people. We um, primarily support other people's brands. And as such, we have a slightly different challenge to many others in terms of recruitment, because sometimes we're recruiting for ourselves, sometimes we're recruiting for ourselves for people to go and deliver someone else's brand promise, and sometimes our people are delivering multiple brand promises on behalf of a number of our customers. The thing that they have in common is that all the things we do are vital services. So uh, we really do things that matter. So when we did our work on our employer brand, it really told us and taught us very quickly that fundamentally what we offer people in joining Serco is the ability to become a specialist in service delivery. And the reason why we started with that premise is that no matter what type of service that we're supporting, the key fundamentals of delivering that service are broadly the same. And underpinning that offer, there are three pillars. For us, the first pillar is really around making more of a difference. A lot of our people work in vocational roles uh, where they're not paid huge amounts, but they do it because they want to make a contribution, want to feel that their role is making a difference. So coming to work with us, what we try and do is enable them to facilitate making more of a difference. The second piece in our employer brand sits around putting their thinking to action. A key part of our corporate offer to our customers is that fundamentally we take the best service thinking from across the business and elsewhere and put it to action wherever it's needed. And similarly, that's what we encourage with our people, is that they look beyond what they've been assigned to, what they've been asked to do, and think about the customer journey and effectively take ideas and share ideas and put them into action. And the third part of our piece is a breadth of opportunity. Um, I, I'm very privileged to work at Serco because unlike um, many colleagues in the room, I don't get to work with one brand every day. I get to work with over 80 of the world's finest brands and to think about how you deliver service and how you fundamentally support those brand promises is a fantastic challenge. And for our people, it means that they can learn from one another, but also they have a great opportunity to explore career opportunities within our company, supporting lots of different things in lots of different ways. Um, so hopefully in, in this panel discussion, we'll, we'll get into some of that today in terms of how we've used marketing to help frame the way in which we're now recruiting people. Great, and I believe we have an animation that you put together. Oh yes, um, I nearly <laughs> forgot. Um, we've got a little an animation which talks to the diversity and the focus on our people being service delivery specialists.
Great, thank you. And I'm now going to pass over to Debbie Whitehead, who works with Marcus at Serco. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, thanks, Marcus, for the background. Um, thank you all for, for coming along. Um, my name is Debbie Whitehead, and I head up the Resource in Centre of Excellence for Serco. Um, so the last uh, few years of my life in, uh, in my career have really been around driving the transformation of our resourcing function to create a global operating model. So we now have um, 120 uh, recruiters around the world delivering tens of thousands of uh, hires globally. Um, and my job is just to make sure we've got consistency for them, messaging for them to enable them to do their job. Great. And Holly? Hi everyone, I'm Holly Middlemiss. I'm talent and social media resourcer at ASOS. My role is very much uh, quite a dual role, so I'm responsible for uh, resourcing specifically for the technology area, but also for our talent branding on all of our social platforms and internal and external events as well. Um, ASOS, I don't know how many of you would have heard of us, hopefully you would have bought things from us before, but we're a uh, leading global online fashion retailer. Bit of a mouthful, I know, but I've got to say the whole lot. Um, we're actually uh, the second busiest online fashion retailer in the world, and our aim, in a nutshell, is to be number one. We want to be the busiest fa online fashion retailer in the world, and uh, hopefully part of my job is getting us there. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, just to give you a little bit of background, so I'm actually uh, originally from the uh, the dark side and from the agency side, and I've been with ASOS for about uh, six months now, and my role is very much headhunting, resourcing for our um, very large uh, technology team, but also for working specifically within sort of LinkedIn, Twitter, really building that brand engagement, not just selling roles, but really getting that brand awareness of ASOS, not just for fashion, but for lots of other areas across the business as well, such as finance, logistics, supply chain, perhaps areas you wouldn't as much, uh, I guess, associate with an online fashion retailer automatically. So uh, that's my job in a nutshell as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so lastly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Lauren Fogarty, and I've been working as a brand consultant at LinkedIn for three years. Um, in my pre-LinkedIn life, um, my career was much more focused on B2B and B2C marketing. So when I joined LinkedIn, I had to put on more of a talent and employer branding hat. So I subscribed to ERE, I spoke to all the right people, read all the right materials, and actually what I learned is that they're quite similar, the two types of marketing. Um, if we look at uh, the consumer cycle, 60% uh, of their decision-making process is made before they even directly interact with the brand. And what we've discovered is the same is true for talent acquisition. So for all of you in the room, um, ensuring that you're monitoring and influencing what's being said about your brand on social media channels like LinkedIn, like Glassdoor, like Twitter and Facebook is increasingly important. So talent attraction is not too dissimilar from consumer attraction. Marketing 101 says that br brand engagement and awareness is crucial up front. Um, and the same is true for talent acquisition. So we're going to spend the panel uh, really discussing what Serco and ASOS have done to really integrate their marketing and resourcing uh, departments. And they're also going to share some very tangible examples of how they've achieved that. So you can leave the room today with things you might want to think about doing when you're back at your desk, probably not on Friday, but on Monday morning. Uh, so the first question we have is, why has getting your recruiters to act like marketers been important to your organizations? And if we could start with Serco. So um, I'll, I'll pick up and then let Marcus add on as well. So um, for me, we've, got, uh, we've built a global resourcing model that has 120 recruiters. So they're recruiting tens of thousands of candidates a year for the organization, which means that they're speaking to hundreds of thousands of people. So they're a huge external voice for our organization. Uh, so after we'd sort of embedded in the, uh, the, the resourcing teams in each of our global regions, we provided them with some consistent tools and uh, equipment to help them do their job. And some of that is about presenting Serco globally and joining up. So some of those tools would be a good example, would be LinkedIn. The piece that we were really missing was enabling our recruiters to talk to the Serco brand. 
So our recruiters know what, we, what job they're recruiting for, and that can be as diverse as air traffic controllers to hospital porters uh, and nuclear scientists. They know the jobs, but it's about knowing what we stand for and how to make that stand out. And that's not their job, and we should be making it easy for them to do that. Uh, so with a little help from our friends in marketing, we, uh, we sort of uh, went banging on their door and said, if you're doing anything on brand and you want to trial and pilot it, can we please be the first in resourcing because we're such a big voice outside of the organisation. So to me, that's why it's important for recruiters. I think just picking up on, on Debbie's point, the, the other aspect is really that um, our business um, is a very rapidly growing business in terms of the number of recruits and the, the, the number of people coming through our door for specific customers. And the cost of that recruitment could be horrendously high if we didn't adopt approach in which we could fundamentally source more of those candidates directly. The second point is that you can't live in a world where you're looking tactically at each individual role. Um, we need to build a pool that we can dip into and draw from to meet the flexing demands of our business, whether that be role type, individuals or geography. And the, 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 the change from tactical sourcing roles to relationship marketing, where fundamentally you're taking a pool on a journey and you're able to mine that at the points where you need them for roles is increasing the way which we're going to support the growth within the business. So it's pretty fundamental to our business plan in, in terms of how we're going to grow globally. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you're both saying. I guess from my side, I look at things from a little bit of a different level because I'm, um, in terms of the marketing side of things, I'm sending out the tweets and, and going to the, sort of the things and, and being sort of a brand ambassador. And I guess for me, um, one of the most important things when you're saying, why is it important for recruiters to act like marketers is absolutely for them to be brand ambassadors. I think everybody that is representing your brand needs to be a brand ambassador. Now, for me, I've got quite a good example, actually. So one of the reasons I was actually brought on board into ASOS is because there was a lot of problem with attracting technology talent, purely because when you think of ASOS, you think of a fashion destination, you don't necessarily think of a technology destination, which is absolutely absurd because we're an online-only company, so technology is the backbone for us. But we realized we really needed to rebrand ourselves, really need to shout about our technologies a bit more. So as an example, we've got um, great resources in uh, merchandising and buying. They may call somebody up and say, hey, um, I see that you're a merchandising assistant at the moment. Would you like, uh, would you like a job at ASOS? We've got a, we've got a merchandising role. And um, hopefully they would say, God, yeah, ASOS, merchandising, fantastic. Now, turn that around and imagine calling, say, uh, this is just, I'm stereotyping, so just bear with me. Imagine calling a 40-year-old senior software engineer and saying, hey, uh, we've got a job at ASOS as a lead software engineer. How, how about it? Are you interested? And honestly, the responses I've had, one being, okay, ASOS, that's a, the sister company of Atos, isn't it? So nobody knows, nobody knows who we are in technology. And I was brought on board to really change that by being a brand ambassador. You can then go on, and I'm sure as you're all aware, you can then go on and talk about your company and your brand and what you're doing and the technologies you're using and how fantastic it is. Absolutely, and you can do a great job of doing that and get them interested. But there's no brand association there already. They're not associating with your brand, and that's what we really need to look at. We need to look at the future rather than the present for us. So that's by engaging with these people at events. For an example, something I'll talk about a little bit later is we actually hold um, internal events about specific technologies we use, about different projects we're working on. So two weeks ago, we actually had one on um, Azure technology. And what we found, the feedback was people saying, I didn't know you used Azure, that's amazing. Do you have any jobs at the moment? So for us, it's really important to get that brand association out there before, so you can dip into that warm talent pool, and that talent pool is there waiting for you. And it makes your job a lot easier. It's very easy when we talk about recruiters acting as marketers to get caught up in buzzwords and, and kind mm. of conceptual ideas, but what does getting your recruiters to act like marketers actually look like for your companies? And ASOS, if we could start with you. What does it look like? Um, I think we actually have a couple of slides, do we? We do. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so I've just pulled, um, if you've got your smartphones on you, I don't know if you want to go onto our uh, LinkedIn ASOS company site and just have a look, because some of these aren't the most updated ones, but they're just snippets if you want to have a look, and follow us if you go onto it. Um, so these are just a couple of examples that I wanted to use. Um, of how we use recruitment and then also the wider employees of the company. So as you can see here, with most recent, um, one of the most recent updates was for our app uh, success and where we were in the app charts. So obviously we're saying here, uh, following our success in the app charts, we're so excited to see we are now editor's choice for new apps. Um, that's fantastic. Now that's led by the talent team. Um, that was me posting that, that was me putting that out there. But what was great is I had collaboration from uh, somebody in the mobile team, which is essentially a sub-department in the technology team. Having that engagement with existing employees is absolutely fantastic, and don't underestimate the quality of that. There's a lot more buy-in with a head of mobile saying something than just you know, a, a, a resourcer, to be honest, if you're looking to tap into the, mo the mobile uh, sort of audience. So this was an example of how we essentially engaged with um, our internal employees, used them, leveraged them, and then we led it and we put it onto um, the page. I think there's a couple more as well, uh, a couple more demos that I had. So this is another one. So we, um, I'm sure you all do career fairs. We've got quite, as you can imagine, we've got quite um, a large pool with interns and uh, sort of first jobbers and grads. Now, we're really fortunate to have a fantastic person on our team um, who actually is a specialist, a very much a subject matter expert in going out there and speaking to students and people who are interested in internships and things like that. She's very much focused on student-specific branding, which is very different to the kind of, the, of branding that I do. Yes, the tone is the same, everything that we do is the same, but ultimately, what she goes out there and does is knowledge share and is informative, makes people feel comfortable and like they could essentially get their foot in the door. So we go to these sorts of events, we talk about them, and she does presentations, things like that, but she does more as well. She's really engaged in that market, and for us, using her as a marketer as well as a resourcer in her specialist area is just one of, I think, the highest quality things that we can have in that team. Um, somebody who can go out there and talk to people just all day, every day about what it's like to be at, at ASOS and how they can develop and grow. Very different to what I do, and I certainly couldn't do what, what she does every day. Um, but having that existing person there, I think, is something that's really helpful as well. I think we might have another one. Um, and then just also how we talk about on our LinkedIn page. Um, so Tuesday for us, it's New Starters Day. So we like to, the content that we like to use and we essentially go, reach into all the different resources and we say, would you like to put anything on, on LinkedIn? What, what's going on in your area? Because I might not necessarily know what's going on in buying and merchandising or in legal or in logistics. I know what's going on in technology. So because I'm responsible for essentially putting everything out there onto our social platforms, I need to know what's going on in the wider team. Now, I'll be open and honest, it's work in progress. It is something that still, we're still developing, but it's something that's, that's going on every day. And I reach, out to, um, I reach out to the resourcing team, and they, as marketers, are very in tune with what's going on and saying, Holly, you should tweet this. You should talk about this for our area as well. So um, yeah, there's just a couple of examples there for you. Thanks, Holly. Sarko, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think from, from our perspective, it's, it's been a, a very um, interesting journey. As I mentioned at the beginning, we, we haven't got a culture of marketing within our organizational brand. And we started off um, by trying to define what it is we wanted to become, and particularly for our people. And I think the lesson that we learned very quickly is that you have to involve people right at the beginning. And in doing the research and listening to what our employees were saying, what prospect individuals that we want to recruit were saying, and bringing those stories back into the HR team, into the marketing team, enable people to change their mindset and also enable people to have a shared goal around what it is we wanted to achieve. And I wouldn't underestimate, it's really important for if you have HR, marketing, for everyone to be on the same page and go through that journey together. And that mindset then extended into really starting to think about who we wanted to recruit, what did they look like, what did they need, and thinking about how we needed to build out specific offers. As I mentioned, our employer brand has a number of components to it, which can be flexed up and down depending on the type, the geography, and the nature of the role that we're looking for. And it's starting to think through it in those people's foot, in their shoes, trying to think and putting yourself in their position as to what it is they need and want. So that whole change of mindset piece was the first thing we embarked on. The second piece was really around the clarity of the offer. And, and Debbie touched on this earlier. 
really making sure that we weren't coming up with marketing bullshit, that we were actually coming up with things that people would feel comfortable saying on the phone or putting in a piece of correspondence or putting online. So the way people have described our company in the past is literally around the things we do. If you talk to our employees in Serco today, they will say we run the DLR, we run um, the Dubai Metro, the Atomic Weapons Facility. They list out a whole thing, raft of things of what we do. Now, we can't overnight change the way in which they talk about us. What we have to do is introduce that into the way in which they currently do that, so how they can um, build off where they are rather than getting them to make a wholesale change. So we're very realistic that it's not going to be an overnight move for us in terms of conveying that offer succinctly. And the third part for us was really important that we put the right tools in our recruiters' hands. So we've um, spent a lot of time and effort thinking all the way through those touch points of recruitment, whether it's recruitment fairs to the, the correspondent, the thought pieces that are being developed, how it is that we move along that relationship marketing journey and recognize that we need to provide the content that fundamentally supports that and how recruiters can use it effectively. Um, we put that together on a, a, a version of our brand hub so that our recruiters can access that depending on the types of pools of uh, recruits that they're, they're looking to try and go after. So again, we're early on this, this journey, but we've already learned a number of things, which is definitely get on this train, make sure that you're both getting a shared understanding of what your audience needs, what they, what they require, because that's the most important thing. Everything else becomes relatively simple once you're both singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, just uh, backing up what Marcus said, really, I guess from a recruitment perspective for our people around the world, it's making it easy for them to deliver the messages to the candidates that they're speaking to. Um, so that's, that's one way that, you know, it's really working for the recruiters. Um, and that consistent message, you know, e even if you're not, if they're talking to, you know, hundreds of thousands of candidates, we're not going to hire all those people. But you certainly want those people to go away and be thinking, similar to how they do with the other brands, you know, if you want to work in technology, it might be, Google or FMCG might be Unilever. If you want to work in service delivery and make an impact in communities and, and delivering public services, come and work at Serco. So you want people to be having that conversation when they've met us. And so having the, uh, the, the talent brand sort of more embedded um, by the recruiters is really helping drive that message out. And the other piece to Marcus is um, a, a, a piece around the tools for recruiters is that recruiters shouldn't be just sitting there doing their job and, 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 and hiring. We should be empowering them, enabling them to start becoming more strategic in how they um, internally have the conversations and having talent brand. And as Marcus said, you can tune it up or tune it down depend, depending upon the geography or the type of role. Um, it puts some of the power in their hands to do that and, and turns them into real business partners that add value as well. Thank you. Uh, when we've spoken over the last couple of weeks, you shared a really interesting example of a very targeted marketing campaign by your recruitment team in the Middle East. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe talk with the audience through that, because I think it's really worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, back in, um, our, our business in the Middle East is, is growing very, very rapidly. But we also have a challenge in the Middle East in that um, increasingly the governments there are asking to, us to recruit um, Middle East nationals. Um, not to recruit from the outside in and basically get people to run their services. They want to build their own skills base in those countries. Um, so for us, about reaching out in particular to undergraduates was a, a key fundamental in terms of building that talent pipeline. So back in January, uh, there is a big event um, called the UAE Careers Forum in London where a lot of these students that are studying over here in London um, but w want to go back to the Middle East um, come to understand um, what career options are available to them. So this is the first time we've attended an event like this, and as you can imagine, um, that event is populated with pretty well-known brands in the Middle East like Etihad and Emirates. Um, but, and, and again, from a career standpoint, nobody really is thinking about A, a career in service delivery, and what does that really mean, but secondly, really don't really know who Serco are. So in response to that, we had to start that journey, and the way in which we started that journey was really by having a, an interactive stand that fundamentally try to move away some of the misconceptions around what service delivery means, what it's about, to show the variety of career options 
and the fulfillment that comes from delivering something that really matters, allowing them to use their ideas, and the breadth of opportunity a career like that can provide. Mm -hmm. So that event was a huge success for us in terms of um, driving people through that. We then also made sure that the journey didn't stop there. So it was all about trying to get them engaged and signed up to LinkedIn. We ran a competition at that event, which was all about their ideas towards Expo 2020, which is happening in Dubai, um, which is looking about the new models for growth um, within the region and globally. So they contributed those ideas to that, which, which also provided a discussion point, which we were able to take on and create a community around LinkedIn. And that community has started to grow fairly substantially over the last 12 months. We've seen a pretty good growth in followers in that region. And we've also had success in recruiting out of that pool immediately. So for us, it really did hit a number of buttons in how you can bring the offline into the online and can keep the momentum of the discussion going, as well as trying to seek out new roles. So it's been a huge success for us. Yeah, I think what was really powerful about the session that we did at the, at the Middle East Graduate uh, Forum was that it was a storyboard. So the collateral that Marcus's team and the expertise they, they, they bring to, to having this career stand that told a story. So, um, you know, it was sort of starts off with what is service delivery. You know, it's not pubs and clubs. It is healthcare. It is transport. Um, you know, have you got what it takes to be a service delivery specialist? And for a graduate population, engaging them in a, in, a, in a sense of giving something back to the community was hugely powerful. Um, they were really engaged with that. They, they came and talked a lot to us and we got really good feedback about what a fascinating brand, what a fantastic place to work, what a, what a difference you can make there. Um, and we were stood next to sort of even very shiny banks and airlines, you know, then it kind of says what it does on the tin. Um, but, and, and this is the expertise piece in, in partnering with marketing, that they, they bring the simplicity around, we just deliver great service. I say just, but that's what we do. We deliver great service, whatever that might be. Um, and that was very powerful for the graduates. And one of the things that Serco did is they encouraged uh, participants at these events to follow them on LinkedIn and share the content that they were able to uh, uh, to make at that event, so various pictures. And as a result, they saw a, an uplift of 185% uh, from followers in that region. So it shows if you can be very targeted yeah. and uh, connect offline with online, then that means you have an open conversation with those individuals going forward. Yeah. Um, Holly, when we spoke before, you shared a really interesting example about your A Day in the Life project. Um, and I think it's a nice example of what's possible outside of LinkedIn, because of course, there are other social media channels. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's uh, quite easy for me to go off on a rant about LinkedIn, so I'll, I'll stop that for a minute. You should start paying me, Lauren. <laughs> <I should. laughs> um, but so we did a really interesting uh, Q&A project, if you like, through Twitter. Um, what we wanted to do was essentially give people an insight into um, not just what it's like at working at ASOS and maybe things are a little bit more fluffy, but some real quality insight into the different teams, um, how people perhaps in various teams got their role, what they needed to do to get there. This was very much aimed at uh, first jobbers, grads as well. And we, we felt that there was perhaps a little bit of a gap. We wanted to give them an insight and give them the opportunity to communicate with us. I think one thing that we recognized, it was very, um, very clear that, that it shouldn't be a one-way conversation on your social media platforms. You shouldn't have your consumer and your audience talking at you and you not responding. So it's all well and good to post updates, tweets, talk about how amazing you are, put an amazing video out there. But if you're not talking back to them, they're not going to engage with you and they're not going to be as emotionally connected, um, however soppy that sounds, with you. So it's really, really important that you talk to them. And that's something that we um, recognized and we wanted to expand on. So as you can see here, we did a QA. and um, This first one, I've got a couple of examples, but this first one was with somebody in, social, in our social media team. We wanted to um, essentially attract people. This was all led by resourcing. We marketed it, we advertised it. We advertised it through our social platforms as well beforehand, about a week or so before, and then we gave a countdown to it. So we wanted to give people the opportunity to ask us on um, Twitter things um, about the company and about the role and the, the areas they're interested in. So this is another example of how you can get your wider employees to engage with you and really help you with your resourcing and for them to also be sort of brand ambassadors. So we got, um, we got Trina from uh, one of the, the social media teams to essentially sit on the Q&A for an hour and talk to people and answer their questions. So you can see that uh, Katrina there asks, did you have to intern before you got a permanent job in social media? And we used the hashtag, uh, hashtag ask ASOS. 
And then obviously Trina's reply, no, but I did graduate in 2005, uh, so the market was easier, which we all know. Uh, and social media marketing didn't really exist then, which is quite ironic, seen as uh, what we're talking about today. But that was really um, a nice example of how people could people could talk, uh, talk to our employees, ask some questions, feel like they can get the, their foot in the door because what I think something that we realized is that grads and people who wanted to get their, their first jobs didn't necessarily just want to talk to recruiters and career advisors who will give them a lot of the same information, useful information, but a lot of the same information a lot of the time, which would be um, make sure you do this with your CV, make sure you do that, and make sure you write your cover letter. They want to know the real detail of what can I do to get your job? What can I do to be there? And that, we had a lot, a lot of engagement and positive feedback from that. A lot of people asking actually about ASOS jobs. I think I've got another example as well where we went to a different department and we used one of the um, user experience architects. And uh, we, you can see here the feed that we've used and how people have been sort of asking questions about projects, um, about the sort of platforms and things they're working on, um, the di all the different sort of systems and things as well. So it's a lot of insight for people to go, oh, ASOS are doing, you know, ASOS are doing a QA. and um, I'm, I'm going to ask them some questions. And it really helps them relate to you. So, for me, I would say that it's been something that's worked really, really well for us and something that we, we hope to continue to do as well. Thank you, Holly. Um, something we hear from our clients a lot is that talent brand often falls into that ambiguous area between marketing communications and the resourcing department. So can you talk a little bit about how you share the responsibility and how you collaborate together? And Serco, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, I, um, I have a little bit of a bugbear with this because the debate around who owns it is, is, uh, is, is boring and tiring, I think. <laughs> but um, if we spent as much time actually doing things together as we do discussing about who should be doing it and owning it, you know, we'd get a lot more done. So I think um, f for us in our talk with my sort of recruitment hat on and then let Marcus uh, speak, but for us it was quite opportunistic the way that we've um, approached the talent brand. Uh, it's not that there was a big strategy and big investment needed in this. We just recognised as a function we needed something and there was a big gap. Um, and so for us, it was, you know, we can't do it all ourselves and it's not our job. You know, we're, we're not in recruitment developing, um, you know, creative messages and all, all that kind of stuff. You know, that's where our marketing colleagues help, help with us. So to me, it was really just about the natural thing would be go and collaborate, go and find someone that knows that can help us. And, and so it's been very much Marcus and I in partnership mm -hmm. with, um, uh, well, just Marcus and I in partnership really kind of pushing this along together because we know that it, it creates momentum, it creates excitement, it engages our recruiters as well, enthuses them to attract people. Um, there's just, there's not a downside to it. So that's, that's kind of where I, where I come at from it rather than, sort of who owns it and who has budget. We've actually uh, funded, given Marcus some money, um, and we involved our recruiters in getting the stories as well. So our recruiters around the world came back to me with stories. We gave some money to Marcus. Marcus sorted out video in and putting together the films of those stories. And we've got some really powerful um, uh, storytelling videos now that, that are, are incredible. And some of the stories that come out from you know, a hospital porter changing one thing for, for a patient in a hospital and the customer satisfaction goes up and the hospital are pleased. And, you know, those kinds of very, very small things. But that's what making a difference is and that's what service delivery is at, at you know, at any level in the organisation. So to me, it's not about who owns it, but just what are we going to do together to, to get it done, really. No, I very much echo Debbie's point. I mean, nobody said at a senior exec level that must go and do this. It was a question of the enthusiasm, the results that were being shown really driving the momentum on this. And I have to say we've got fantastic momentum now within the organization. And I think it's those little steps and showing um, the success that has really drawn this together. And I, I don't feel that we're part of a different team. I mean, I, I find it rather odd anyway when people talk to functional responsibilities. It's really about what we want to achieve together and how do we get to that point together. And I, I talked a bit earlier about having a shared goal. And I think right from the beginning of this, we've been very clear and worked very hard on getting that shared goal and everything else becomes very easy after that. So um, I, I, we, we'll probably have some trials and tribulations as we run through this as it starts to get even more momentum. But for me, um, if you can take that whole ownership issue off the table and look at it together and see what you can contribute, you can make massive strides and, and when you get it going, it just doesn't stop. 
Yeah, I think our... Um, I, absolutely, that sounds like a wonderful way to work. <laughs> Unfortunately, we haven't sort of had... I guess ours has been a little bit different in that I was specifically brought on um, to have that dual role between talent and uh, the social media sort of branding and things like that. I think the reason why it perhaps doesn't work as a cross co collaboration as, much, as well as it would work with you guys is because for us, our, we have a, a large social media team who are um, on Instagram, Pinterest, and they're fantastic, absolutely fantastic at what they do. But they're very much um, focused on talking about sort of this season's trends and dresses and hats and things like that. And they don't would not have a clue where to start if they're talking about um, sort of resourcing and recruitment and really sort of engaging with people and keeping people sort of warm and, and in that talent pool. And vice versa, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think that I would do very well if I went on to Pinterest and started talking about hats, mostly because I don't really know much about hats. But it's, it, for us, it was a bit of a difficult, um, a bit of a difficult one, really. So I was brought on to do that dual role and essentially sit in the middle, not just for social media, but just for the sort of talent branding overall as well. Um, what I would say is that does sit uh, fairly separately from marketing and communications and also um, social media for us at the moment. But we do work with other teams uh, with our talent branding and we absolutely aren't an isolated sort of function. So for an example, some of the, um, the teams that we work with quite closely are internal communications. Um, so I'll often get content and things come through and I'll send it through to our internal communications guys. They'll then put it out into the organization. And I think that really um, builds on sort of brand loyalty and, and that feeling of pride with employees as well when they see, oh, okay, we're not just talking about the, 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 you know, the fashion side of things. We are a business. We're an end-to-end -end business. And we're talking about bringing people on board. And I feel, you know, I feel really happy that I'm part of that growth. So we feed things into um, internal communications. We also um, are doing quite a large piece of work with uh, corporate responsibility as well at the moment. So I'm actually working um, with corporate responsibility to, it's actually next week we've got uh, an event, an evening event for Uday and Care, which is a charity that we've been working very closely with for the last few years. Now the evening, it's a charity uh, fundraising event and it involves sort of cocktails and canapes and a luxury raffle and things like that and sample sale. And we've had the opportunity, um, we've organized and arranged for it to be all third party suppliers invited in for that. Now, those third party suppliers include, of course, our recruitment agencies. Now, we're quite fortunate that we um, have 80% direct sourcing at the moment because we've got, a, we've got a great resourcing team. But that 20% um, that we use, we absolutely want to have a partnership with them, not just um, them working for us. We want the partnership there. So what we thought is, why don't we bring those guys in and them to get a real feel about ASOS and what we do as a company and what we're about because they need to be our brand ambassadors too. We just assume that they're, we just assume that they're there and they're going to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the people that we want and know, and know, what, um, know what, how to sort of sell the company. But they don't necessarily unless they type something into Google, which anybody could do. So we thought, bring them on board, give them a real insight into ASOS and what we're doing and what we're looking to achieve. And all the sorts of things that are going on, and it's a buzzing environment, the next time that we need them and they pick up the phone and they call a potential candidate, they can really talk about us and they can be that brand ambassador for us as well. So that's one way that we've been working with um, wider teams across across the sort of various departments. Once again, that's work in progress and something that we want to continue to do. And it's very much sort of at the beginning of that, but it's absolutely something that we want to, um, that we want to sort of continue with as well. So this is a LinkedIn conference, uh, and I was hoping you'd be able to share some examples of when you've uh, been working with the LinkedIn platform as a talent brand channel, um, and be honest. Serco, if we could start with you. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm really proud that we're here today and I'm really proud of the journey we've gone on with LinkedIn. I think we've approached uh, our LinkedIn relationship very much as a partnership like we have with marketing. It's obviously lovely people at LinkedIn, which is obviously um, a highlight for us. But I think from the beginning, um, it was the, the data that LinkedIn had that really drew our attention. Uh, in an organization where we, we are not, uh, our strength is not very sophisticated systems and management information. 
um, actually partnering with an organisation that could help us with that was, uh, was very attractive. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've actually, I'm, I, I'm really proud of our followership and uh, we've actually got one of our senior recruiters here today who's done a lot of work on this, so to give him credit for the engaging stories up there. But in a couple of years, we've gone from, from 9,000 followers to 100,000 followers. And I think we're still understanding what that actually means, why those people might be following us, but it's certainly, um, f for me, a real sense of pride, despite a very challenging year for us, that people are still interested in following Serco and hearing about Serco um, and seeing what, what we're doing. Um, I think it's a great um, tool for our recruiters as well from a developmental perspective. So uh, we're looking at you know, how we, how we uh, get certification for our recruiters. We're looking at how it makes them more strategic advisors to the business, so creating uh, sector focus groups that you know transport recruiters around the globe will join and network and get transport specialists in. Um, and actually, we've gone beyond, in an organisation where we were a little bit shy, I think, of, of social media and promotion, um, we've gone beyond the worry of our leadership that if, if we're doing anything with LinkedIn, isn't it all about people wanting jobs or nicking our people and all that kind of stuff? And we've moved way beyond that um, to the point where I think some of our leaders see that LinkedIn can actually be a very uh, useful strategic tool, even in a bid and a BD environment, in terms of the data that can give us. So... Um, it's been a great, great journey for us. I, I've just just add to Eddie, uh, Debbie's point. Um, I think the the journey we've been on is, is just at the beginning, and, and the data and insight that we're gaining, not just in the recruitment sphere, but in our markets where we are operating with governments and with businesses across the globe, the number of connections that sit in there that are open to us in terms of building our brand and building out our business development pipeline are immense. So we look at this very holistically in, in terms of a, a means to build our brand and to build engagement with a number of different stakeholder groups. So we've only just started, as I said, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to really getting underneath the skin and seeing how we can make even more of this in the next 12 months. Absolutely, just to, I think, echo what we've both said. We feel that we've, we're absolutely at the start of our journey as well, but I think we've had a really, really positive experience with LinkedIn. Um, it's helped that we've had regular, regular meetings and meetups with our uh, relationship manager, and also being able to you know, have that data so you can see how things have changed and how you know, things have grown as well through LinkedIn and your social presence. You know, it's all well and good saying, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and it'll be great for us, but when you actually see it and the results, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very rewarding. I think a, a good example of that was I actually met up with our relationship manager a couple of weeks ago. And um, he told me that, he said, what's happened is that in the last six months, 44% of the people that you've hired have already been following you on LinkedIn. And we thought, wow, oh my God, it actually, it works. Okay, that's good. So it's that sort of thing that I think has uh, worked really well for us and been very rewarding. We've actually been doing quite a lot of work um, and sort of campaigns and things as well, partnered with LinkedIn. So one of our um, problems, which I think I mentioned earlier, is being seen as a technology destination, not just a fashion destination. And that's something that we really want to tar wanted to target. Another problem which you're probably all aware of that's been going round and round and, and debated and debated on the market for the last couple of years is female talent in technology as well. And everybody knows that there aren't enough um, females in technology and that's something that really needs to change. So what we decided to do, we um, partnered with LinkedIn and we were part of a video series that they were already doing called LinkedIn, What's Your Dream? And um, essentially what they wanted to do was to find somebody who was perhaps interested in fashion, um, but didn't want to work in, work in fashion and perhaps had another area of interest. So they wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily associate them with, with ASOS. But um, we put together a video. We chose one of our QA engineers in technology uh, called Danny. She's great. She's a great brand ambassador. She does loads of blogging and things for us already. And she essentially um, was part of a video uh, to show how ASOS is also a um, hub for technology. So if we could show the video, that'd be great. I'm still overwhelmed that I've taken the leap and I've actually made it. I grew up in Andover in Hampshire. It's quite a sleepy town, there's not really much to do there. It was always a massive deal to go to London. 
I've always loved fashion and shopping. I'm a self-confessed shopaholic, really. But I just always knew when I was at school that computing was my thing. It was my favourite subject and I wanted to work in technology. After graduation, a lot of my friends went to London on graduate schemes, so I felt a bit isolated. That's why I decided to join LinkedIn. I put all my experience on there and as many skills as I could think of, and I followed all the companies that I loved. Because I followed ASOS, a test engineer job was displayed to me based on my skills. I never thought in a million years that they had a technology department. I thought this is my chance to go and move to the big city and have this amazing job. And I didn't think it would happen, but it did. <laughs> my job combines my two passions. I get to work in technology, but I'm also in the fashion industry. I walked down the catwalk on my first day <laughs> just for fun. I was just really, really excited to start. If it wasn't for LinkedIn, I wouldn't have found the job. I wouldn't know that ASOS had these roles. I'm still overwhelmed that I've taken the leap and I've actually made it. Um, so yeah, that's one example. We're really, really proud of that video, actually. I think that that's one step for us is showing uh, what we're actually doing in in ASOS across different departments and hopefully warming that talent pool and people actually realizing that you know we are a tech hub as well and everything that's going on with us it's not just about fashion and working with LinkedIn really gave us the opportunity to do that I think as um, Debbie and Marcus said it's not just about jobs and, and looking and things like that it's very much about looking at it as a marketer and what you can do to get that existing talent pool interested in your company. So it's been a really positive, I might just be biased, but it's been a really positive experience working with, uh, with LinkedIn. Great, thank you Ollie. And that's a great example of content, but sometimes when we're talking to organizations, getting content created and finding budget and resource for it is easier said than done. So can you share some examples of uh, your journey from actually getting that content created and distributing it out into the marketplace. And Serco, perhaps we could start with you. Yeah, I, I, we started from a very low base. So for us, we, again, started with that premise of standing in the people's shoes that will be receiving this content. What is it that they wanted to know? What did they want to hear about? What was it that was going to inform them and help them on that journey? So we spent quite a lot of time thinking about that. And in building the key components, the underpinnings, most of it was really around who we were, what it was like to work at Serco. So we did a number of um, videos across our business which looked at how our people bring service to life. So the common theme comes across in all of those multimedia things, and those work extremely well and bring the color. At the same time, we started to build out bits of content that gave a bit more depth around some of our sectors. So recently, we ran an event for ex-service people. We take on a large number of ex-service people into roles in justice, in immigration, um, and in some of our defense businesses. So it was really trying to give them more depth and content which we posted up on LinkedIn and allowed them to get more of a flavor. And I'd agree with Holly, it's, it's important that this isn't um, driven from a corporate perspective. So it, bringing those stories to life from the people that are working within our business, the case studies that make it real is the most important part of it. And some of those things have worked and some of them have not worked as well. And the great thing about using a platform like LinkedIn is you learn very, very quickly um, which things give you the best benefit. Moving on from there, and again, picking up on Holly's point, it, it's really about the conversation. So we're now building out rafts of content. And again, the cost of this content isn't huge. You'll find you'll have masses of it within the business. It's merely unlocking it. We have people who sit there thinking all the time about how service can be improved, right from the people working in the catering departments at hospitals who have found new ways of bringing hot food for breakfast to patients, all the way through to people thinking about new models of service delivery for um, uh, defense customers, or for transport customers. And that content is there. You just have to find a way of unlocking it and rewarding it internally. And the biggest reward is to see it being pushed out externally. So we have a group of people now who are constantly giving us that content to be able to post, to be able to gain conversations around. And more of that content is where is we're going to head. Because with most of our economy now working in the service industry, no one is really taking the lead in, in becoming the go-to service brand. I mean, you can talk about 
about the virgins of this world, you can talk about hotels and retailers, but in the B2B space, it's very difficult for anybody who wants to embark on a career to really think about where do I start that career. And we believe in Serco that if we do this well, we'll become that go-to brand. If you want a career in service delivery, you'll come to us, you'll think of us first. But that means we have to share more of our knowledge and our tools. So during the latter half of this year, we'll be sharing and making more openly available the critical tools that drive great service delivery, all the way through how do I build a customer experience a journey, how do I handle complaints and complaint handling. Our goal is to put that in the hands of people and to think very carefully and very strongly and positively about our brand as a, one that has a motivation to, around delivering better service. So I think we're on a journey with our content from informing people who we are and what we're about, and now we're in the second phase of that in terms of bringing our offer to life. So we'll be intrigued to see how that goes over the next six months. Yeah, and just um, to Marcus's point around unlocking uh, this content from the organization, um, you know, we are a people-based business. We don't manufacture, we don't produce anything. We have people delivering great service. All those people have fantastic stories, and our recruiters um, are probably one of the core groups in our organization of, of internal employees that are speaking to hundreds externally and speaking to all of our hiring managers as well. So they've got a really good feel for the business, uh, a deep understanding as well. And I think because of the journey that we've been on um, together between marketing and resourcing, um, they've actually started to feel empowered to actually partner with marketing themselves and, and go out, reach out to Mark and say, I'm doing something on global healthcare. Can you help put together a fact sheet. It might be you know, something very simple and straightforward, hard copy, or it might be a, a piece of animation. Um, but actually what, what we're doing is unlocking our recruiters' potential to give those stories to us as well. Um, and I think, and think building on Debbie's point, it's not, um, I don't want you to go away with a, a feeling that something gets chucked over the fence of marketing to produce something. Um, it's not that at all. Effectively, we will always try to get them to think differently, to give us a real insight into that audience, you know, where they're at, what they're thinking, how they're motivated, to build that pen portrait. Because the more you can get that, the more effective the solution will be. So I think as part of this journey, we're moving from, dare I say, a, a tactical approach on I need some collateral, to getting people to start the fundamentals, to really ask the difficult questions, get those right first, and then have a very strong brief that not just talks to a tactic, but a journey that we're moving these people along. And that, again, is part of that education learning process that we're running through with recruiters. And also, we're in marketing and learning a lot. I mean, this is a, not a market that we're overly familiar with. So we're getting more and more nuances around that audience that means that what we're building out for them is getting better and better. Yeah, I think absolutely agreeing with what you're both saying. You're on a journey, as we are as well. And um, it's, it's interesting to see how things sort of play out and how things develop as well within that time and with content and how content matures as well. And I think we're quite fortunate in that uh, we're encouraged to create content and go out there and reach out to uh, the production team and the various other uh, departments as well to, to be able to create content as a re resourcing team. Something that we're doing actually at the moment, which uh, one of our resources wants to do, is with the current interns that we have, year-long year -long interns, and do very rough and ready videos of them um, just in their day-to-day -day life. So although the video I just showed was produced immaculately and was uh, very, very sort of swish, that's not necessarily how we operate with our content. So we really encourage to have quite, um, as I said, rough and ready content. So something just shot on a mobile phone, then uploaded. That's the way the whole company, that's really the company's ethos. When you see um, all the, the models and the pictures going up onto the ASOS site, that happens within a few minutes. It's shot, and then it goes straight up onto the site. And we're encouraged to do the same with, um, with resourcing. So if we want to uh, use content, we can shoot it by ourselves on our phones then put it out onto our platforms as well. I guess um, slightly different to Debbie and Marcus, uh, because I'm using the content on a day-to-day -day basis and trying to find the content, um, I guess in terms of advice that I would give, I'm sure you're probably, a lot of you are doing it anyway, but I do follow, um, I do follow articles regularly at the beginning of my week because I do have that dual role. It can sometimes be quite difficult managing both sides of things, managing the branding and the, so, the social platforms and also the resourcing. So at the beginning of every week, I will sit down and I'll think to myself, what content do I want to distribute this week? What do I want to do? 
things like the video I just showed, obviously a little bit more of a, a longer game, things that need to be developed and, and produced and shot. But there are lots of things that we could do immediately as well within our content that we can just pump out onto the site, pump out onto, um, onto Twitter, LinkedIn, talk about it as well. I think what I would um, also say, which I may have some disagreements, but I'm going to say it anyway, uh, content for me is also the events that we're hosting with our specific um, with our specific teams. So, for example, in a fortnight, we've got a event, an internal event, with uh, one of the guys in big data, and it's going to be about big data and retail uh, and the transformation between that. For me, content doesn't necessarily mean videos and, and visuals and, and writing things up. It can also mean it's, it's all about the quality and what you're distributing as well. So, for me, content are the events that we put together, are the events where we're talking about us and what we're doing. And that's where we find that's very, very rich in content and we're getting that po most positive feedback actually from those sorts of events. So for me, I would say that actually events and what we're holding, that's all content. I think you can get quite bogged down in the word, but for me, content is everything that you're distributing and putting out there um, to, to mark as yourselves and, you, and your brand. Thank you. Um, so that we leave some time for Q&A at the end, if I could just ask each of you to leave the audience with one piece of advice on how you can get your resourcing department to leverage marketing. And Holly, maybe if we start with you and work this way. OK, I'll try to be quick. Um, <laughs> for me, I would say one of the uh, something that, that I was told um, a few months ago, which really sort of uh, struck, struck me as true, was make sure that you autonomize your talent brand with your talent pool and your talent pipeline, because that is essentially the same thing. Those people that you're trying to connect with and you're trying to engage with, they are your brand. They're the people that you want. So try and autonomize that when you're going forward and when you're looking at things as a, from a marketing perspective. I think one other thing I would say, it's fantastic when you can have that cross collaboration within, um, within departments. So Debbie and Marcus, that you've got that collaboration is fantastic. What I would say, though, is from a resourcing perspective, don't be scared to take it into your own hands. Don't be scared to send out those tweets. Don't be scared to write on LinkedIn. You guys are the subject matter experts in your areas. You are the specialists for resourcing. So don't underestimate yourselves with that. I know it can be very scary, and mistakes probably will be made, and they might be viewed by, uh, by lots of people, but you don't learn, and you don't know what works best unless you try and unless you, unless you move forward a little bit courageously with it. So um, that's something I've learned, and I've made mistakes, many of them. Um, I think for me it would be around engaging your recruiters and your brand. Um, they should be your talent champions. They should be living it, breathing it. It's the, you know, go home and tell your loved ones what you do and who you work for, feeling proud of it. Um, so, so that would be one piece of advice, just engage them. And by that, I don't mean go, you know, to Marcus's point, just give them things, actually engage, get their thoughts on it, um, get their thought leadership, their buy into it. Um, so that would be one thing. And, and actually to Holly's point, I'd say don't always ask for permission. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we started the LinkedIn journey by um, asking for forgiveness from comms once we start to consolidate all our pages and everything. It was before Marcus joined though, so he wasn't one of those, that's why. But um, you know, sometimes you just have to start these things off because you know they're the right thing to do. Um, and you know, there's not a downside. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just the right thing to do and you have to have the, the courage to go ahead and do that. Well, I, I think Debbie's being a little bit um, uh, lacking confidence in the, the journey that you started off with because I was, I was recruited via LinkedIn um, <laughs> before I came on board, quite clearly. So they must have been doing something right mm -hmm. uh, in that process. And I think they've created a great platform. And I, all I see is really us being able to work together. And if you're constantly sitting back and trying to stand in your audience's shoes, that's the most important thing. You get that clear, shared understanding of both where you want to go. And I think once you've got that, everything else becomes relatively simple. So not stopping asking the questions, what matters to them, not what matters to us. Um, the day you start sitting there thinking about what matters to the organization all the time, I think you're lost on this because you'll start pumping out things that are irrelevant, will be annoying, and won't gain you the sort of engagement that you need. So we yeah. constantly have to ask ourselves, are we really doing the right thing by our audience? Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. We have about three minutes left, so if there are any questions from the audience, if I could ask you to please come up to the microphones um, and put them to our panelists. Hello. Hello. Hi. 
Um, I've got a question for Holly from ASOS. Um, so I've, as part of my role in a previous job, I did a bit of what you do, nowhere near as much. Um, and I just wondered who controls your messaging um, and who do you have to kind of run things by for approval and how do you manage that? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually, there was a lot of debate around that when, um, when I first came on board and there were quite a few uh, sort of headbutting against the wall with that. I think one thing that we discussed was that originally we were saying everything maybe should go through editorial um, so that everything is monitored and censored to a sense before it goes out onto our platforms. But what we, um, essentially what we argued ourselves was that everything is it's live, it's going, it's, it's very, very fast paced. We don't have time to put everything through another department. If we've got the ownership of this, if we're owning it, if, it's, if we're the, the experts in this area, then absolutely we should own it and it shouldn't go through something, it should go through us and us only. I did actually have a conversation with uh, the editorial department and uh, they were, they were surprisingly easygoing about it, actually. And they said, that's fine. Um, in fact, I'm, I've actually come from a publishing background originally, so they were, I think they trusted me uh, with the editorial content and things like that. But ultimately, we're really lucky in that we can get everything out just through us, through our resourcing team. Um, we have a strict ASOS code and an ASOS tone. So we, I essentially have a folder about this thick on the things that I'm allowed to say and the words I'm allowed to use and what I'm not allowed to use, uh, which I had to brush up on before I started posting on behalf of the company. Um, but once I did that, once I had the relevant meetings, I was free to go and it can just go through me. And also, what I, what I must add, it can also go through a couple of other members of the team within Twitter um, and the other areas. So it's quite, we're quite fortunate in that we can just get things sort of moving and it can, we can keep the momentum up essentially as well. Great, I think we have time to squeeze one more question in if anyone does have one. This one? No, nope. okay. In which case I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Debbie and Marcus from Serco and Holly from ASOS. I hope you enjoy our keynote speaker, Baroness Karen Brady, and I hope to see some of you at the drinks later. Ladies and gentlemen, our closing plenary session will begin at 5.30 p.m. Our closing session begins at 5.30. Thank you very much.